Hello, welcome to Off Track, the motorcycle racing podcast. As always, I'm your host, Dave Neal. Um, but this, this is something special. This really is. In the presence of two Lincolnshire legends, Roger Burnett, Roger Marshall. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Roger, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, cheers, Dave. It's uh, good to be on board. Uh, we've talked about it for a while, so let's make them laugh. I think we should do. I think we should. It's been it. It's been it. We'll get to that shortly because I think there's so many people looking forward to this chat, and not least of all me. Yeah, I think it's going to be something special. But it's been a busy week for announcements and people moving around, and Jonathan to Yamaha, and who's going to take his place? It's been a busy old week already, and it's only Wednesday. Yeah, I think I think the Johnny to Yamaha was on the cards. Um, he clearly sees something in the Yamaha package that he feels he can improve what he's doing. I mean, let's first of all talk about Johnny Ray. What an absolute incredible rider. I mean, I remember the first time Johnny Ray was selected for the Red Bull Cup, which was we did a selection process at Cadillac Park, (laughs) and there was Eugene Laverty and Johnny Ray selected. And the people that didn't make it was people like Cal Crutchlow, which, because it was an all-round experience and Linda Pelham from Red Bull wanted us to give this all-rounded rider the opportunity, Cal was great and fast, but we always felt there was a bit of polishing needed um, and he's went on to do amazing things. So fair play to Cal, he's a great guy. Um, but Johnny started out at that point and then, if you like, really got held back by Honda Remember him breaking his leg, his femur at Knock Hill, which was a real knock to him. Um, and then he went on to be so... So I'll tell you a story. Paolo Cipatti, no, David Tardozzi in the World Superbike paddock said to me, I want Johnny Ray to partner Troy Bayliss next year on in the World Superbike team. This is gospel truth. So I got Johnny Ray in my car at Cadwell British Superbike in August, which we've just had. Sat near Park Corner with him in the car and explained to him what I felt it could achieve for him. And the truth of it is, he was talked out of it by Brains, who was his engineer then. And they decided to stay with Honda and they went Super Sport World Championship with Tenkate because it meant staying with Honda. And Honda were always gonna look after Johnny Ray according to Johnny Ray. But of course, that didn't come to fruition. Um, Johnny had a rev- relatively low level of success with Honda. Tenkate was strong. You know, I'd come off the back of the years with James Toslin with, with Tenkate. James had won the World Championship 2007. So this is after that, 2008, in fact. Um, and it didn't work out for, for Johnny. And the minute he got on the Kawasaki, you know, it all came to him, I think the combination of what he's had, Perry Reeb has been amazing. Uh, Gwyn Roder, the team boss there is really relaxed and, it, and it's a great environment for Johnny. But clearly he's not going to leave that unless he could see something in the Yamaha that was going to give him something more than he's already got. Bear in mind, he's racing week in, week out with that brand of bike with Top Rack on it. And, you know, we know how special Top Rack is. And Johnny would be the first to admit that. So replicating what Top Rack's done on that bike is a tall order. But Johnny Ray has ridden on the edge every lap, every corner for, for the last couple of years just to stay with them. And I don't, I think it's only, and I'd love Roger's opinion on this. I think what we see as X riders is somebody that's putting it on the line every corner, every lap. And I remember messaging Johnny and telling him I'd never seen him ride so hard not to win a world championship. Uh, and I think that's been the case in the last couple of years. I would agree completely. And it, it, the shades a little bit of um, of Casey Stoner on the LCR bike of having to ride that to get on the Ducati, ride that. Then he gets on the Honda and it, it looks fairly fairly easy for him. So it, there is a, a massive element to that. He's followed Top Rack around enough over the last couple mm-hmm. of seasons to get an understanding from his view mm-hmm. of what the Yamaha can do, where it's stronger. Reg, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, obviously, Rog, I completely agree with him, but uh, sometimes riders need a new challenge, um, new crew chief, uh, new direction. So 
Um, it'll be interesting after six world championships uh, on a Kawasaki to see uh, Johnny go. So it uh, and Top Rack obviously on the BMW, he obviously feels that he can do something with it. We know it's got the speed. We've seen it. We've seen it in BSB. Um, you know, even the Ducatis can't pass it down the straight in BSB. So, and it's the same in the world. So, I think if Top Rack gets his head around that, we're going to see something quite special. Uh, and like I agree with Rog, Johnny's rode so hard in the last couple of years and put it on the line. And other interesting moves, obviously, Ronaldi. Will be uh, they'll be getting rid of and uh, Bulliger will be taken over and Bulliger looks a good package now and he's a big lad and I think it'd be interesting to see him on the Ducati as well and we've also got uh, a lot of things going on in BSP as we all know um, unfortunately untimely death of Paul Bird uh, it's uh, a really sad situation after all the years and uh, I think. Um, Shaky won five titles and Islop won one and then I think they've won about eight titles. So um, it'll be interesting to see if the team keeps going and uh, what's going to happen there. So, and obviously with Steve Rogers pulling out, it's a big loss to the sport. But um, I'd like to thank Steve and uh, in-house joke coming up, Fleetwood Motorcycles, because he'll watch this <laughs> and he'll, he'll say... Uh, Okay, Rog, Fleetwood Motors. I said it on at BSB once, of course, it was an in joke for years. So, but uh, looking forward to the party, Steve, in November. I think I'll be invited. I hope so, even though I've jumped ship. So. <laughs> I'm sure this is, this is, I think you'd be pretty close to the top of the list yeah, yourself. But, um, for that one, yeah, but. a bit of a merry go round. And Jack Kennedy now uh, parting ways on good terms with Martrain. So, um, a lot of shuffling going about and unfortunately Danny Kent's team packing up. So, yeah, there's lots going on like there always is, but it seems more than ever this year. It does, doesn't it? And it's all turned up in the last sort of 48 hours. And Just, you, you, you gentlemen understand riders far better than I do because I, I go for the, the personality side. You understand the riding side, something I never will. <coughs> what are your thoughts on Jack? Because I think he's done a really good job this year. He's been consistent. I know he's on the same package as McCams and OMG. Yeah. But it's kind of his first season, really. He had one season with GR. Yeah. And then he's had to sort of relearn again. Well, I'll have my shout first for Roger, but because uh, Jack on the 600 is virtually unbeatable. Um, we've seen a lot of riders step up to BSB before on suit bike. Yeah. You need to carry corner speed. But when you jump up to BSB, if you want to be a front runner, then you've got to be you've got to be something on the next level. It's not people think you get on a two hundred and forty brake horsepower motorcycle after a six hundred carrying all that corner speed, etc. Yeah, you have good meetings and bad meetings. I've seen it with Danny Buckham over the past people who step up right from Roger and I's day and my day. When people went up to big bikes from small bikes, they went back down again, like probably 75% of them. Jack, I feel I'm friends with him, but I've got to speak the truth. I think he's had a good season, but it's not good enough for what Tim wants in my train. So, um, yeah, he's rode well, but he just hasn't quite got there. He's knocking on the door at meetings, but... Other meetings, he's struggling for top 10. So, and people who put a lot of money into the sport, um, we'll come round to it later, but every rider needs something different in a package, in a team. Um, and for some reason, it just don't quite work for him this second time round on the super bike. Roger? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I understand. So, go for it. I understand. <laughs> um, I understand completely um, <clears throat> what Roger's saying. I actually, Jack Kennedy has actually surprised me this year because obviously his credentials on a super sport bike speak for themselves. And as Roger said, there's no way that 
you could beat him on on that. And he, he's proven himself year after year. But I, like Rod, you know how difficult is that step? And I'm actually surprised that he's done as well as he did. And that's not being disrespectful. So I'm actually understanding that I thought he would easily keep his ride, but I'm not close enough to the team to understand the expectations of the team owner. And if the expectations of the team owner are that he wants to actually challenge to win, then Jack Kennedy's not the man to do that. Sure. Um, But then, you know, it's very difficult to say who is. I mean, we could debate that, and we should probably, because every rider's got their peculiarities. I agree and completely. Strengths and weaknesses. And not even the people that are winning are the strongest. So it's, it's very interesting when you actually start debating it. But I wish him well. He's a very likeable guy, um, and I wish him well, and I hope that he does find uh, another superbike ride. But as Rog said, you know, the way the paddock is at the moment, it's not that easy. There's going to be more riders than seats, it seems, um, as we move forward. No, it, absolutely right. And if depending on what happens with PBM, we'd love to see yeah. Jordan and John Mowat continue for, for Paul's legacy and two bikes on the grid. They're one and two in the championship. You would suggest that one of them will win the championship this year with the way it's gone so far. Yeah. I know the points change for the next two rounds and then again at Brands, but... You would say if you're with your, your heart, you'd maybe go with Kyle or Ryan or um, or Jason. But with your head, you'd probably go with Tom and uh, and Glenn. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you've got to go with when you've got the fastest bike on the track. And that's not saying it's easy to ride the fastest bike on the track, but it's very easy to control. And we saw at Cadwell that Glenn was not the fastest rider all weekend, but the minute he got in front, He was almost unbeatable. So all he had to do was get to the front and use his speed to get to the front. And if you like, his aggression, because he's got loads of that. Um, And that's what he did. Um, You know, Tommy came good in the third race because he probably had to. Um, He was ready, wasn't he? After a couple of not-so-great rounds, especially Thruxton, he had to be back on the top of that box for his own mental well-being to take... The challenge to the title. Yeah, and he's always been good at Cadwell, hasn't he? He's always been good at Cadwell. So, um, well, you know, it's been inter- interesting because we've had. We'll go back to the the um, the PBM team in a second because I think there's an interesting um, debate about that because obviously we want to see that move forward. But absolutely, we'll talk about finance somewhere down the line because I think it is very relevant in BSB. Hence the demise of the Danny Kent team, you know, it's about money in the end. It is. Um, but we were talking earlier, Roger and I, we, you know, we've just had the Grand Prix of Catalonia and we've just had what is a normal crash at the first corner. And it was normal, whatever anybody else might say. It was just a crash brought about by somebody being too ambitious up the inside, which they all should have the respect for each other not to do that. You know, you don't win the race on the first corner. Of course you don't. But, hey, it's almost like club racing when you yeah. see that kind of incident. And it shouldn't happen, but it does. So that was a normal incident. And then Bagnaya has a normal high side. But there's all this hoo-ha about how lucky we all were and how horrendous the crash was and everything else. And it was horrendous because, yes, uh, Brad Binder just ran over his leg and that could have been really bad. But we've, we've seen it so many times. And it's like Rog said, they've almost got used to not high-siding bikes. Yeah. Well, that was the biggest thing for me out of that. The last time, I don't you guys, you, you'll be able to correct me on this. The last time that I can recall seeing a high side that vicious was Danny Pedrosa at Aragon when Mark leaned in on him and he cut the, mm. the sensor cable to the rear. Mm. So he had no traction control and he just threw the flip-flop in front of the wall. That was the last time I could remember a high side that big in MotoGP. Well, it doesn't seem to happen anymore. No, no the, the high sides that you see are generally on a closed throttle, going into a corner on a closed throttle because either the tyre's cold or something's not quite yes. right, the balance of the bike's not quite right. So, you, you know, you enter the corner with a closed throttle and the rear comes round. There's nothing you can do about that. And so we've seen that, but we've not seen one under acceleration. No, it was on the transition, wasn't it, between yeah. the exit of the first... Yeah turn one, turn two, into turn three, just as he's getting on the pattern, all of a sudden, 
and not seen one like that for a long time. But again, as people running over legs, Hutchie will attest to that. And it happens, unfortunately. But then you relate back to Cadwell, where you get a fast corner after the after the start line. There was not one incident where one rider went off at Coppice no. on the first lap of any race or Charlie's. So why? Because actually you've got to be more respectful because it's a fast corner. I think, you know, any, tra- any track that's got a slow first corner after the start, you, you're subject to what happened in Catalonia and, and then it spoils it for the spectators more than anything. Four bikes out. I know that they re-entered the race, although Bagnaia and Bastini didn't. But it does spoil it for the spectators. And, and whatever anybody might say, there's very few riders that can jump on a second bike when they've preferred one bike, that can jump on the second bike and deliver the same level of performance. Possibly Marquez is an exception to that. I don't know what you think, Rog, but... Yeah, I just think... Um, I go back to Rossi, really, when traction control, etc. come in. I, I personally... I know... You've got to develop in racing, but I'd have preferred it not to have come in because although they said it's safer, I've, I've watched GPs like Silverstone, etc. And when you haven't got a great team behind you, you watch at the first corner after Woodcut and a bike that's cutting out early, etc., etc., who haven't got the knowledge of some of the other teams, um, they're never getting the bike right to stop it eyesighting and stuff like that. So I'm a bit old school, really. I, I think like when you can buy a, a bike off the shelf if, you, if a team's got the money, but they haven't got the infrastructure in the team to set it up like another team, then you're always going to be second fiddle. But um, yeah, it's, it is what it is. It's a bit Formula One-ish to me now, but it's the pinnacle of the sport and it's where still where all the riders want to be. It is. I mean, you're always going to, in, in any form of racing, you're always going to have the haves and the have-nots yeah. in terms of the best engineers, money, whichever. Yeah. One thing that, that's changed about Cadwell that, that you gentlemen would remember, they've taken the oak tree out. Yeah. So you're not going to get target fixation Coppice. on that at Coppice. Because that's one yeah. thing that I remember is, is from my turn and years going there, having that thing at turn one, just in, the, in your peripheral. Yeah. And also, talking about tight turn ones, as you were talking there, I was thinking to the, of the BSB and all of the tracks in the UK. They've all got quite quick turn ones. The Donington maybe is arguably the tightest, but it's still it's not a, a stop start. They're all yeah, fairly yeah. fairly quick turn ones. Yeah, Knock Hill's yeah. tightish, tightish and downhill and downhill. Yeah, yeah. tricky Knock Hill, I would mm-hmm. say. Um, and it's not long from the start line to the That's first corner of Knock Hill, so. No. Not much time for people to space themselves out. And of course, the debate at Catalonia is, do we move the start line nearer to the first corner? It's still going to be the, the, the corner, still outcome. the same angle. Same outcome. So nothing's going to change. It could that. even be worse. Yeah. 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 Because you don't hardly get settled. No. But for the speed they go, why not take that out and just make it a nice, smooth mm-hmm. beat? You've got the speed to do it. Mm-hmm. But is that even more dangerous? Possibly. Possibly. And while we're talking about Catalonia... I've got to say a huge congratulations to Aprilia. Um, it's very obvious that that I would say that, except I've been quite involved with Aprilia. When Sam Lowe's went to Aprilia, I did the deal for him in 2017. Um, they were lovely people. Um, Fausto was then, Grassini was running the, the, the team, but Romano, the engineer, was really up against it. And he's a very, very nice guy, but a very sensitive guy. And because um, Gigi Delinia had moved and jumped ship to Ducati, he was left holding the baby. And the board, the board uh, um, of directors at the Piaggio Group put him under a lot of pressure to deliver. And of course, they were not delivering in, in those early days. But it was always obvious to me that they would in the end. Um, you know, probably have never failed when you think about it. One, two, five, two, fifty. Then they go well. They put a world superbike out there with pneumatic valves and win, and it was only a matter of time before they got it right. And I just want to say a huge congratulations to them. Mm. They're not the biggest factory in the world. They're not the biggest no. bunch of people. They've got a huge amount of passion, huge amount of passion, which is fantastic. And I would like to see Aprilia as a next step 
put go back into World Superbike as a manufacturer because I think that would be a fantastic mix to put back in to the manufacturer spread in World Superbike. And, you know, World Superbike is going from strength to strength. I see Ian only looks like he's going to be out on a Ducati, which is another, another strong rider. Let's see what he can do. But it's another rider in the mix. There, there are so many in that. And with, as we said, with the rider market and what's um, Digi going to do, and there's so many people moving now that the, potentially the World Superbike is an option, maybe a drop back to Moto2 for, for some of them. It, all paddocks these days <laughs> seem far more cutthroat than they've ever been. And MotoGP has always been fairly clean cut in that respect but i think world superbikes is coming the same british superbikes yeah. also now because we're losing two seats with raceways for definite yeah and as you say there are more riders than good seats yeah i mean the 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 issue is why is and this is the question i know the answer but i'll tell you that ask the question the question is why isn't there a british rider in motor gp that's the question um and actually if you look at the way the structure of MotoGP is with Moto3, Moto2, and look at you know the kid that won at the weekend, 16 years old in Moto3, why would anybody choose a 27-year-old Brit against a 16-year-old, you know, whatever nationality he is, he's 16 years old, he's winning Moto3 races, he's going to get a chance. Yes. Of course he's going to get a chance. And so he should get a chance, quite rightfully. But there isn't any structure, and we all, we all wave the flag of how amazing BSB is, the best domestic championship in the world, which it is, uh, without question, but it doesn't provide a route to MotoGP. Now, you could say that Jake Dixon's bridged that gap. It's taken him seven years to so bridge that gap. He's still five years in Moto2 now with two race wins? Yeah. yeah. That's a long time if, when you've got people who are coming through, and I understand exactly yeah. what... Jake's a great rider, but there are people that have gone round him and progressed into MotoGP yeah. while he's been in Moto2. Well, yeah, because the point about that is that um, you've got to understand it's like a footballer. We're talking about Liverpool and Mo Salah at the moment. We're not here to talk about football, but we may as well liken it to football. Mo Salah's 31 years old. His contract runs out at the end of next year and the Arabs have offered him offered Liverpool 200 million. Well, it's definitely going to happen. I can tell you that. Everyone's speculating with it or won't it. But he's 31 years old and he's got he's out of contract at the end of next season. Whether Klopp likes it or not, he's going to lose him to the Arabs for 200 million because Liverpool won't get the opportunity to get 200 million in for him. So age is very, it's a very fickle sport, our sport. And age is very, it determines what opportunity you get. That's the truth of it. And Whilst Jake is winning races and probably deserves a MotoGP ride, it's going to be very difficult for that to ever happen, in my opinion. I think he's probably got a promise that if he wins the Moto2 World Championship next year, he may get a chance. I'm not sure. And Frankie would tell you that. Yes. But I, I can't imagine that he would have settled for doing that. When you think he could have gone on the factory Kawasaki of Johnny Ray's, maybe... Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, isn't that a better option for him? He's ridden a superbike before. He's ridden a Kawasaki before with Lee Hardy and won races. So why not? Sometimes yeah. it's not MotoGP too much the focus. I know he's in the GP paddock now, and it's that's the goal is to be in MotoGP. But would you risk going there for maybe one or two seasons? If, it, if you don't make the grade quickly... You're going to be out because it's a results-based business. It doesn't matter whether he's British or what. You've got Rory Skinner coming through. You've got Scott Ogden coming through behind him in the next couple of years. But to have a look then and go, hang on, look at what Jonathan's done. It's 11, 12 rounds a year versus 20. You've got potentially six or seven years worth of, of career in World Superbikes versus two in MotoGP. Um it's a difficult position to be if, in. If I'd have been in charge of Jake Dixon, he would have been, on Johnny, question. What would been you on Johnny be? Ray's bike. I'd have made that happen. And I think that would have been a great career move. And I think you've got to understand there's no point in doing Moto2 unless you're going to get in Moto GP. Agreed. Doesn't there's take no, you anywhere. There is no point. No. It's a support class. And Sam's the epitome of how it's become second, very much second level in Dorna's eyes. You know, you've, you've, you're losing uh, the warm-up in the, in, in the Sunday morning, race day morning. 
uh, you gain limited amount of track time. You very much treat it as this is all being to accommodate a sprint race for spectators. So, hey, Dawn has got it right because the show is it's all about the show. And the mm. show's the right thing. And it's about audience in the end. It's about pleasing the audience, not pleasing the performers. And the riders are the performers. And so they'll kick off and have something to say about it. But in the end, it's the show that will win out because the show will happen whether you're in it or not. It's exactly that. And some of them don't get that. Um, but I, I just think that, you know, Sam's understood that there's got to be an easier, not an easier, but a more enjoyable way of going about your job. And when you love riding bikes like Sam does, and Sam is, wears his heart on his sleeve, Roger knows him really well. You know, my godson is Roger's son, Adam. And Adam spent so much time with those two lads, the twins, when they were younger. Mark Phillips, Captain Mark yep. Phillips, yeah. used to ring me and say, Rod, you need to look at these riders. They're amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> and so, but we know that Sam's just such a lovely kid that loves riding bikes. And I get that he's not enjoying himself. And actually, you look at his ra- race at, at Catalonia, yeah. and it was the epitome of somebody that wasn't actually enjoying himself. And he, he finished eighth, 2.8 seconds behind the winner. And had he been enjoying himself, he might have been a lot closer. A lot to be said. Just, just like that is just my himself. opinion, by the way, Sam. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just my opinion. Um, I haven't spoken to Sam, so I'm not... But he, he'll probably agree with what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, back to this transition of how do we get Brits to MotoGP? I mean, it all starts by now. There's very much a barrier, and that is, do you know the tracks? So, Dave... I'm in MotoGP and you're really good, but you don't know the tracks. Have I got? It's so expensive. Do I invest in you for a year to learn the tracks, or do I make you go with somebody else that's prepared to invest in you to learn the tracks? Because that's what it's like. And the same applies in World Superbike. So you might get a really top guy that's really good and dominates the the British Superbike paddock and can't transition to World Superbike. Because guess what? You don't know the tracks. Taz is a classic case. Yes. Taz McKenzie. Now, before that, there was Scott Redding. But Scott had done MotoGP, so he knew the tracks. So it's they easy, which way it's way. easy for, for that to happen. But when you don't know the tracks, they're very, very reluctant to invest in you. So that's a barrier. And the second thing is that, of course, BSB rules and regulations, for whatever reason, don't permit teams to do wildcards anymore like they used to do which gives you a flavour, which gives a team the opportunity to have a taster of it to see if they might want to transition to it. And and that's, again, because I imagine MSV want to keep the show together and don't want people drifting away from the show, as we saw in the past with Ben Atkins did it, Birdie did it in his day, Sean, Sean, um, G- GSC Racing did it, Sean Muir, and, and of course, um, <coughs> Pata Yamaha, was, they were all BSB they teams. They were, they were a Crescent team, yeah. So... Mm. And, and when you think the factory Ducati team isn't owned by Ducati, you're probably not aware. No. It's owned by an organisation called Feel Racing. Okay. And Feel Racing is an independent team that run, fa- that run and get the support from Ducati to run the factory Ducati team. But it's not actually owned by Ducati. It's and, an education for and me as Feel well. Feel Racing as are lovely, listeners. lovely people. And me. In fact, I went. As well, in fact, when I went Roger to Donington, knows more about GP than I went. <laughs> when I went to Donington to the World Superbike, um, the owner of Field Racing came to me to find me to say hello to me because of the deals I've done with Neil and James and uh, Hodge and James through the years. But we always had a great and still have a great relationship. So they're an interesting <clears throat> organisation. And in fact, when it was unsure about how Ryan might progress. I was very keen to get Ryan on Bulliger's bike um, because that would have been an opportunity. Certainly. Um, and then you've got progression. You know, with Ducati, there's always progression. It's, it's very difficult with any other manufacturer. I don't know how you see that, Rog. Yeah, I was, I'm going back to what Rog said about BSP and the show. Um, I think, yeah, we're losing maybe two teams, or but... The show is the show, and between Stuart Higgs and Jonathan Palmer, every year things might look like they're going to just tail off a bit, but there'll be something come, and they always seem to make it happen somehow. And 
obviously we just had Cadwell and we've had probably fifty or sixty thousand through the gate over the weekend. And that's a lot of money. And somebody like Jonathan who wants to keep the show good and Stuart, um it, they'll they they won't want to see teams leave the paddock. So I can see something happening in that department. But um like Rod says the world is the world and, and like there's a lot of people in it I like and Giovanni has become good friends with, with him and uh, he, he always wants to see us and invite us over and, and that environment in the Ducati people and D- David Tardo, who I raced with uh, in the world Formula 1 as it was then. So, yeah, there's a lot of progression in that. You both raced with David A. Tardot, yeah. didn't you? You and the TT41, you yourself at World Superbikes. Super yeah. 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 So, yeah, interesting. Well, character. we both did the world first ever World Superbike, where Rog did. Pullman. Paul. I think I finished fifth overall on the Padgett's GXR, so. Hmm. And the lap on those still have it and they won't sell it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> they never sell anything. That could be. That's just, just to. Just to, 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 to Pick up on what Rog said there, then about about the show, the BSB show. There is no question about the entertainment factor. Let's no. be honest. No, hundred percent. And actually, you know, Stuart's been very <laughs> clever in bringing club racing into BSB because if you look at the BMW Cup, the standard of the rider in the BMW Cup is a good opportunity for a club rider that would have been a club rider, if you like, to be on a bigger bigger stage and a bigger platform. In a re- relatively low cost, relatively I'm speaking, low cost championship. And I think that's very clever. And I also think that that's also very entertaining. Um, I'm, I'm actually, the R900 BMW Cup thing, I think it's a step forward. I think it's a good entertaining um, race during the weekend, let's say. And I know there's heats and finals. Um, but it has to sit alongside what is the premier. Yeah, class, which is BSB. But what I'm going to say is quite controversial. What I'm going to say is that if you have a show, to maintain that standard of show, you need to invest in it. And the investment that that goes into BSB is considerable in terms of the health and safety and all of the things that go into the organisation of it. And I get that that is not, not inexpensive. I'm sure it is. But then the, the cost for the teams doesn't get any support from the show. And I think that's where there needs to be a discussion for to make it all sustainable. I mean, it doesn't affect me, it doesn't affect Rog, but what it does do is it affects the show in its long term. Because when you do get a team like the Danny Kent team this year that halfway through the year decide it's going to cost it's costing too much, I mean, that budget would have been mm understood at the beginning of the year surely so i'm not sure how you can get halfway through the year and say this is costing too much and i do understand that the sponsor had some um some some contracts cancelled some construction i believe some construction jobs cancelled so that's possibly um made it impossible for them to continue i'm not sure but what i'm trying to say is that if we're talking about keeping the pbm team on, tra- on the track, um, I've got no hesitation in saying that I think Jordan and Johnny and the team and Phil Borley have got every bit of capability of making, yeah. running that job 100%. and making it happen. Yeah. But you've got to understand where the money comes from. Yeah. And, and that is the thing that needs to be underwritten. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know the financial circumstances, but I know yeah. that that team... Is, is the most expensive team to run in the paddock. It's running Ducatis. You know, they've got 20 engines. It's not an easy, and it's a very expensive brand to run at the highest level. You know, Paul, through his enthusiasm, invested heavily in that because he wanted the best and he wanted to win, um, which was exactly why he went racing. Good for him. Sure. But that leaves, that leaves the team in a situation where they need the biggest budget in the paddock and I'm I'm not sure how they're going to make that happen because the problem we've got is that the the 
the value, the media value of the show doesn't equate to how much it costs to do it. Understood. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. So you're relying upon the enthusiasm and passion of people to make it happen. The Steve Rogerses, you know, the Alan Gardners, yeah. the Paul Birds, bless him, and so on. You're relying upon those people, the FS3 boys. You're relying upon their enthusiasm because there isn't a sponsor, there isn't sponsorship value where anybody could even break even, let alone make money. So whatever the spectators believe is happening in BSB when they all flood into Cadwell and think this is amazing, actually it's costing everybody that's on the track a fortune generally. Am I right? Yeah, definitely right. Um, and I think that needs addressing going forward because it's about sustainability. <clears throat> it, 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 <laughs> you find that. I mean, I've worked within the teams in the paddock and to, I've never got involved in the financial side, but you listen to conversations and you're part of conversations that it's costing an absolute fortune to put on the show that is the British Superbike Championship when, you know, it's widely known that superbike riders don't get prize money. Why not? Why don't teams? Get, I know teams that there are financial assistances in place from MSV to the teams. I don't know whether they pay entry fees, things like that. There's certain things waived, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not a huge amount. I mean, versus Roger knows, a one point five. Well, Roger knows more about the financial side of this. Definitely. The last time I was involved was uh, in the sport and I knew a bit about what went into it financially is when Ben Atkins contacted me to run Red Bull Ducati. Well, we started with the Kawasaki's for a start, which was uh, David Jeffries and John Reynolds halfway through the season uh, because one of the teams had packed up, and me and Chris Anderson, Spanner, we ran easy on it and he was immediately splitting the... Um, uh, Cadbury's Boost Boys up on it. But um, after that year, me and Ben went to the Ducati factory and did a deal with them. And um, then we got Red Bull as a sponsor. Um, and so I think I was there four or five years and left after 2000. And I think the sort of money Red Bull was putting in then was, uh, this would be year 2000, was about a million. Uh, so... And before that, as Roger and I know, in our career, it was all like the cigarette sponsors, et cetera. So that, people like that, that they were that flushed with money, the tin of Red Bull, uh, we went on a course and I think we were selling it in nightclubs for about four quid. And I think were, about two P a tin of Red Bull came out, out of the factory. So, you know, and same as cigarettes. So, there was a if somebody wanted to do it, they got a lot of exposure out of it uh, because of the television, etc. So um, there's not quite that sort of sponsor about anymore. No, and if you think back to 2000, we were on terrestrial television, so the yeah. audiences were bigger. Yeah. Um, and I will say this: if Ed Sheeran booked out Wembley and got a hundred people to buy a ticket, how much would he be worth? Zero. Because he can get 100,000 people in there, that's the value. So it's, you know, the value you have as a show is directly relative to the size of the audience that you can generate. That's why, that's why the premiership football is the premiership, because it generates huge global audiences. Um, and the rights money from, and it goes back to the teams, of course, the TV goes back to the teams, and the teams get a lot of funding from from the promoters of Absolutely. the show within the premiership. Very much so. So I'm just saying that that there has to be, you know, some some open conversations about <coughs> how this could work going forward. A to grow the audience to generate more income. And then what can happen with that income? Um because when we we as a business were running the marketing for the GSE racing team with Neil and James and Chris Walker was in that team and Neil McKenzie was in that team during that time. We generated a good level of sponsorship, um, but it still wasn't enough to cover the cost. And I can't imagine there's any team then or since in the last 25 years that's ever generated enough budget to cover the cost of their racing if they're going to win, if they're trying to win. You know, you, if you want to finish 20th, I'm sure you can do it on a, 
on a budget that sure. you can, you know, that you could probably substantiate. But to actually go out with a chance of winning, I don't think it's possible. No. Um, but that's <clears throat> I me. Mean, when did you last see anything about <clears throat> motorcycling? Let's not let's BSB World Superbike or Mud. When did you last see in a national newspaper, UK national? The newspaper? only time that motorcycle racing gets national coverage is when something unfortunate happens at the TT. Yeah. That's the only coverage but it gets. I could get press cutting books out, physical press cutting books out from 2000 and early 2000s, 20 years ago, 23 years ago, when every time you open the page, there'd be a na- it'd be a national newspaper. So there's a change. And whether that change is because there's no interest from the media or whether it's because... Because we're certainly as interesting as we've always been to the media. Mm. I mean, I, I don't believe that it's not as interesting now as it was then. In fact, it's probably more interesting. The show's probably even better. I would agree. You know, and Stuart and MSVR has done a great job of making that happen. But for some reason, the media value isn't there, in it's, my opinion. It's not there. I went down to Silverstone before MotoGP and we had lunch with Stuart Pringle, uh, the MD at Silverstone. Um, and we did a little bit of a podcast with him afterwards. And I was talking to his PA and there, there was myself, there was Michael Guy, there was Simon Patterson, there was a couple of other podcasts. Um, but all the Fleet Street sports correspondents had been invited. Not one of them turned up. No. And Matt Oxley, he had a... a, a a second appointment somewhere else, and Matt wasn't there either. But he's within MotoGP anyway. Yeah. And writing for Motorsport magazine. But there were no um, national newspapers present to talk about the event, the biggest motorcycle event, motorcycle racing event in the UK. No, it's like we haven't quite got the characters either who was in the press then. I agree. Like the Ted McCauley's. I mean, Ted, he, he did so much... The sport, I mean, he brought Aylwood back. He got him a deal at the TT. Uh, Aylwood come back and he started winning straight away on short circuits, beating factory bikes on a Ducati that should have never won. Um, and uh, Brown. Won, what? Yeah, John Brown. John, John Brown. Brown. Who else did we have? It was all George around, Turnbull. Yeah, Turnbull, who did all the national newspapers. And, I mean, when the TT was on, um, you'd end up on, uh, like when I got, uh, done for speeding over there. I was on the front page of the Daily Mirror um, because they said I, they didn't think I was going to be able to race because uh, <laughs> the press picked up. You had you used to have a license years ago, but um, that was a big thing for Barry Simmons at the mm-hmm. time. I wasn't allowed to tell the Japs about it. I mean, shouldn't say Japs now, but who cares? And I just said, um, Simmons said, where have you been? Where's your car? And I said, it's... Um, up at the courthouse. I'm banned from driving. He says, well, don't tell anybody. And the next thing, Ted McCauley had it on the front page of the Daily Mirror over there. So we don't have people like that anymore, no, do we? No, but but I think we also need to understand that, that information through social media channels, which weren't around then and are around now, it's made it's made news that instant, and it's it totally devalued. This everything. is the conversation we had before, isn't it? It's yeah. devalued mm. press releases, it's completely news, devalued it. news events. Yeah, because any Tom, Dick, and Harry can be a press expert now. And just put something on social media, and everybody knows. That's right. So, where's the value in anything? Mm. You know, where is the value in anything? There is. I think it wasn't that part of what expedited at the weekend that news had got out about Jason going to FS3. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the, the press release appeared and it became a, it became official. I, think, yeah. I don't think it was maybe due that weekend. No. But all of a sudden, because it had gathered momentum over the weekend and it was all across social media, mm. they're like, well, we best make this official and quickly. Mm. I mean, if you, if you grouped all the social media channels of all the teams, riders, for any, of, any championship, it would be really powerful. But you can't group it. No. Because everybody's so individual and everybody's so competitive and everybody's so much against each other <laughs> that there is no way of doing that. Um, so it loses, it completely gets diluted. And any information that we want to say, you know, it's too obvious and too open for everybody to read. So I, I get I get the problems that we have, but, you know, 
in the days of Rothmans, let's say, which we were both privileged to be able to be part of, you know, Rothmans would actually contract with the journalists. So the likes of Ted McCauley, the likes of yeah. John Brown, George Turnbull, all the nationals would be contracted to, to them and be paid to make sure that they covered what we needed covering, yeah. what they needed covering. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. You know, whether they want to admit to that or not, that is the journalists. Uh, whether they want to admit to that or not, that's what happened. And that was powerful, and it did give us the, the coverage you yeah. know, that, that we certainly got through, more through the nationals at the time. Yeah, we did, yeah. You know. hmm. So it's an interesting one. It's an interesting dilemma, and I'm not sure how to solve it. I'm not sure how to solve it. I would love to think we could get BSB on terrestrial TV. I know Eurosport are doing a great job, and I'm not decrying that in any way, shape, or form. Not at all. Not at all. And it is the home of of, of motorcycles. Well, and it I, is. And I get that. I get that. But it isn't where the audience is. Do you That's not find the it's the same people watching week in and That's week the out? That's the it's, problem. You're it's not the growing um, the audience. casual fans. No. no. If you put it on ITV4, British Touring Cars is on ITV4 yeah. all afternoon. Yeah. yeah. So why could we not do the same thing? For, well, we for used BSB? to be, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. BSB yeah. used to be. Yeah, it yeah. did. It used to be. Um, World of Sports Superbike, go back even further. Yeah. You were commentating on it. You competed in it. We did, we did, we did um, you know, BBC. I mean, I remember yeah. in 1988 competing in the 500cc Grand Prix and going to the podium to do the presentations for the BBC Competing in the 500 race, finished sixth, probably, I think. I held Eddie Lawson up for a long time and he was furious. I remember he didn't pass me until three laps to go and he won the world championship that year. And it should have been quicker. <laughs> yeah. But it was, you know, you're now to ride Donington and he couldn't get five or anyway. Um, but I finished and then went and did the presentation. That's what happened then. Yeah. It was strange. But, but yourself and Stavros, Barry did a little bit as well. And he signed with the, the co-commentary, the yeah. colour commentary as a rider's perspective. Barry did a there. lot of commentary. After, he did. He did. After he retired as well. He went, he was channel, was it channel seven or channel nine in Australia? He yeah. got wide world of sport. Yeah. He covered all that. He did anyway. world of sport and everything. Yeah. 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 And that's when it was great because everybody was then a household name. Mm. And it, we, the cat, they, they were different characters then. We had this conversation previously and the, the, the lads and the, and gentlemen as they are now that, that are growing up and th th there isn't much of a character. Brad Peary, but we don't see much of that because he's not on the TV an awful lot like he was in the super sport times. But the, they don't also I think we get under the, the, the skin of the riders to see who they are. <laughs> And the, the character comes out. Tommy Bridewell's a great character. Mm. I'm sure Jason's a great... What they would be like stood at a bar. Mm. That's the bit that I like. Their true character. Because sometimes they clam up on TV. They're well-versed in thank you to the team, thank you to the sponsors. I, I get all that. But just be yourselves. I also think that the media like money. So the media, if, if we were going to Cadwell and the top team because I think this would have to be team structure. The top team in terms of point scoring for the weekend, there would have to be a formula. I'm just shooting from the hip. Um, one hundred grand. How they distribute that to the rider and what they retain is up to them. If every weekend there was a hundred thousand pound purse to the top team, I think you'd see a lot of interesting, a lot more interest because it would put it on a knife edge, wouldn't it? It would, I'd, I mean, can the riders ride any harder? Probably not. No, I don't um, think so. Would they ride a bit more safely? Probably to finish. I mean, the last laps would be exciting, but I think you would need to be finishing to get the points. So, and I think it would be great to, if there could be some level of investment that was going to make a big purse, as the Americans say, yeah. for each show. Why not? Overall winner, overall points, most yeah. points over the weekend. There can be a championship within a championship if you really wanted yeah. to. The and big actually, prize at the end and rider of the weekend, yeah. because not always the one who scores the most points over the weekend is ultimately going to be the champion because peaks and peaks and troughs. Mm. Well, I think the audience would engage with it more as well. A new audience, maybe, because there's a there's a there's a big big prize at the end of this. Let's see who can win it this weekend, you know. 
and keep it simple, especially yeah. for the casual viewer. Yeah. That's what it needs to be. Nice and simple. Number one is the champion from last year. If he's still within the championship and moving it that way. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I'm on board with that. So we, we want more casual viewers because well, it's the, the, the sustenance of the sport. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you where that would work, how that would work. It would be an investment in the teams technically, which I talked about. And I'll tell you why, because the riders wouldn't need to demand high salaries with the best teams. So the best teams that had the best chance of that success would bonus their rider. Let's say of that 100 grand, you as the rider got 40. Can you imagine winning 40 grand a weekend? You got 11 like, chances a like year Roger, to win it. Roger's day, that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we did all that now. <laughs> but can you imagine how much more they would want to be with the best team and the best bike? So, therefore, the teams wouldn't have to invest as much money in the riders, which would, might might work for them. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to figure out ways of actually making the opportunity greater. It's still our sport, isn't it? It still has, there's plenty of years left in it yet. And to get more people involved and more fans involved in it all, it, it's not a bad thing. I mean, I remember when we first started World Superbike, there was a guy that, and Rog knows him well, a guy called Steve McLaughlin. And <laughs> Steve, Steve McLaughlin ran the World Superbike series when it first started in 1980. His idea. Right? His idea. And it was a fantastic idea and it was a fantastic formula. And... I'm talking to him and all he cared about was the purse, what you could earn, what you could win and how we get to that. That's That was his main focus, which was fantastic. Um, and I, I never forget him saying that he employed, he was run, running, he ran Honda and he employed Freddie Spencer, this guy in the early days. And he said, Rog, I had a guy that I employed to pay the bills. I said, what do you mean? What, in the office? No, no, no. He walked behind me and wherever I'd been and left, he just paid the bill. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Under America. But no, Steve McLaughlin was great because he, he brought a concept yeah. that was the World Superbike Championship, which was a huge, has been a huge thing, <coughs> still going to this day. It's had its peaks and troughs. It's been amazing for the UK. It's been amazing for UK riders. Going back to the foggy days and oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Neil... Hodgie, James, they all benefited from the World Superbike Championship massively and financially. You know, yeah, they've done very well for themselves out of it, and rightly so. And it was nice to get away from some of the circuits that we had to do then to win a championship and stick your neck on the line. Yeah. The Villarreal's and all that. It was uh, scary places. So. Yeah. I mean, the World Superbike Championship brought four strokes off the road tracks onto race tracks. Yes. That's basically what it did, didn't it? Yeah. Well, Formula One World Championship was mainly on road tracks, apart from Assen, and yeah. Assen was a road track technically. Um, and it and the World Superbike Championship brought four strokes into where it is now in MotoGP, technic technically. And and actually, you know, we brushed on on it earlier, but World Superbike is is just about to enter a boom period, a massive boom period. I think Dorna have got it right. I think. There is an investment in the show. They, the teams are benefiting massively from that. Um, it means there's an investment in, in riders and the riders who take, I know there's a financial risk from the teams, but the riders take the physical risk. And Barishin was always a big one to tell you that the, that the physical risk was the most difficult one to take. Sure. Um, and, and, and they get rewarded a lot better, which is great. Because why would you want a why would you want somebody that's risking their life every every week week in week out doing the job not to be rewarded? Because if people want to go and watch it, they deserve to be paid, don't they? Really, you of know, course. they deserve it. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's a deserving thing. So that's my direction where I'm thinking. How do we get how do we get this finance? How do we distribute it? And how do we make these British guys big stars? Because the only way you're a big star is like. If Lewis Hamilton earned fifty grand a year, would he would he be as interesting to the media? Right. But the fact he's on fifty million a year makes him somebody that is really interesting. And the life that comes with uh, that, that people maybe they can't maybe aspire to it, but they can be inspired yeah. by it to to, to work harder yeah. or whatever. And, and I want a bit of that. Love it or hate it, that is 
the way the way the, the way the media and the, the way that's social media, isn't it? And that's the way the public are. They're, they're interested in the the guy that earns fifty million. What's he do with it? How does he live? You know, I think he's one of the only characters left in Formula One, Nelly, who wears different clothes, um, enjoys uh, another part of his life, uh, not like the Verstappens and that who are so serious. I mean, we've had the Damon Hills and and all them, and they were all characters in Formula One. And I think now the show's all about strategy. And yeah. to me, I don't get Formula One at all. No. It's not my cup of tea whatsoever. It's the start, and then the strategy of who changes tyres and who wins. But it's all about being there and being in Monaco and being seen. Part, like Roger talked earlier, they all want to be part of that show because... It's massive. It's massive press. It's a massive thing. You want to go drink champagne and mix. 300,000 people at Silverstone. Yeah. Um, F1 race. Mm. Like, not a spare seat. Everything expensive. A gin and tonic and a pint of beer was like 25 quid or something ridiculous. <clears throat> you know, so, and but everybody's prepared to pay it. To go and watch. But that's the secret. People know before they get there what they're investing what in. They're in for. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I'm saying is the 300,000 there and was the 60,000 for the MotoGP ish, ish over the weekend, which is similar to so, a, a good weekend at BSB or so, at World So why, why is Formula One that much more interesting to the man in the street? Because the general public, why does it have that global fan base when it's not that interesting? And it to isn't. watch. MotoGP is mm-hmm. far more in- mm-hmm. exciting to watch. But you have to ask yourself a question. The only difference is money. Yeah. The it's people huge, investing in it. Huge amounts of money. Do we not still find that from the people that are investing in, in Formula One and car racing, four wheels in general, are middle, upper class motorcycle racing generally has been seen as a as a blue collar sport out the back of a van do you think we we've missed the the sport itself has missed out because of how it's worked out over the years that there's always been that money that's gone into four wheels but the, the oh it's, it's motorcycles it's the back of a van we, we've never really taken that kind of level of money into the sport to be able to progress it the way that the the four wheel side has yeah, i think you're talking really about image. Yeah. And I think from the early days, image, motorcycling. I mean, there's Rog, when he was doing his sidecar outfit in the beginning, laid in the gutter with a pint of beer in his hand and a massive beard and loads of hair. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not the right image. <laughs> Let's right. be honest. <laughs> You're having a good time. Yeah, but it's not the time of life. <laughs> And, but what, what, what I really mean is that I think we have had an image issue. Oh. Um, Major GP certainly doesn't have that. Um, and that's what, and, and I think Europe has become so Motor GP focused, so strong. A star of Motor GP, a Bastianini even, let alone a Bagnaia, in Italy, they can't go anywhere. No. Not walk the street without they're mobbed. You know, if they came to the UK, they could walk past anybody, nobody even know they were. So we've got we have got an awareness issue in this country, particularly. Um, and I think that transcends down because if we were that much more supportive of the pinnacle of our sport, motor GP, if we did were able to grow our fan base and I, and I'm back to TV and BT Sport have done a great job over the years. I think the production quality has been great. I'm a big friend of everyone involved in it. But the audience have, haven't been good enough. They've been poor. I mean, that's the truth of it. And I agree. It's now TNT. And it isn't big enough. The audience isn't big enough. They may pay the money to Dorna, which is great for Dorna. But I remember when it was when we when we lost it from more of a terrestrial channel, the big debate was what about the audience? And, and I think we've suffered. I do think we've suffered. I, mean, it, I agree with what Rog says about that. I never thought about it before, but it's like when Wayne Gardner was world champion, Greg Norman, the white shark, uh, 
was at the Open champ, Golf Champion, and the Australians are like the Arabs say in Italy with Rossi and people like that. Massive place like Australia. Wayne Wayne was voted Sportsman of the Year over there, and when I went to his wedding, uh, I could not believe it. From Wollongong, where he lived in Breeder Street, the church was about four miles, and the streets from his ha- his mother's house to the church were like Princess Diana's funeral in a way. It was like me, him, and uh, the best I was best man and. Uh, the other lad, we, we were all on Honda, brand new bikes, drove from his house in a penguin suits with a police escort and the streets were like that all the way. And it's like, wow, you never see that here, do you? No, no, you don't see it. Not no, since Barry. Not, not since, since probably Barry. No, not since I mean, you, Barry couldn't go anywhere, let's no. face it. I no. mean, every restaurant you went with Barry, I used to, Roger got to know him after I did, but if I was flying out, uh, from Gatwick, I would go down to us in Steph's house and uh, wherever you went with Barry, he was known. And you've got to say, he did more for racing in England than anybody did. In my opinion, he was like Valentino Rossi was. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. No, I mean, he was a massive star that earned a lot of money because he was a massive star. And I always say to, said to my riders that I've looked after, just work on your popularity because that's yeah. your value. If you can be the most popular person in the UK, you'll have a high value. Without a doubt. So work on your popularity. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Barry, to his credit, was the last person in his leathers signing autographs on the tail yeah. lift of his truck, wasn't he? I'll tell you, Cadwell one year, uh, when I was riding the Machen and Saunders Yamaha, Roger will remember there was... The, I think there was 60,000 actually on the day which Charlie Wilson admitted to. So God knows how many was there. And I wasn't expected to run with these boys because it was Reedy, Granty, all factory bikes, Ditchman. And uh, I diced for lead with him. And then I remember he was staying at Woodall Spa. I didn't know Barry very well then. And I was in the pits and I think it must have been half eight, nine o'clock. The queue must have been down to the mountain, to the paddock, and he didn't go until he'd signed every autograph. That sums it up, really. does. It absolutely does. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. That'll do for the end of episode one. I think we'll, we'll break for uh, a drink, and you, you can check your phone for the messages. Yeah, we have well. that background there. It reminds me of Roger and in the camp. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, we'll come back for episode two and how you gentlemen met. And yeah. we'll, we'll get some stories on. So yeah. for the end of episode one, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.